You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you to Stillwater Church. It's just an honor to get to worship Jesus here with you this weekend. Uh, like I said, it's been in just an incredible week around here at Stillwater, and uh, we just are so thankful that you joined us this day. Uh, we are continuing our, our, our message series on prayer, uh, and, and today we're talking about uh, the reality that oftentimes in the Bible, people would bring their friends to Jesus, uh, folks who needed healing, uh, folks who uh, had issues in their life where they needed a touch from Jesus. Uh, they, they would be brought there by their friends. There are so many stories of this in the Bible, uh, countless examples. Uh, you might, might remember one when there was a guy who couldn't walk, remember, and his four friends came along and they, they picked up the mat that he would lay on and they carried him to the house where Jesus was at. And the place was so crowded, so many people had come for healing uh, that they had to climb up on the roof and, and dig a hole in the roof uh, and let the guy down, right? That's a pretty extreme example right there. But people would bring their friends to Jesus because they knew that he could heal. They believed that he could heal. Jesus is not physically walking the earth the same as he was back then. But he is just as capable of healing this day. Jesus is just as capable of moving in our lives this day. So while we don't physically take them to a place where Jesus is at, today what we do is we bring them to Jesus. We bring our friends to Jesus through prayer. And we're going to look at a story today of, of a boy uh, who Jesus is going to, he's going to cast a demon out of this boy, okay? A pretty extreme situation. And, and it's an interesting example in contrast because Jesus had just gone up on a mountain uh, with his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. And it was one of the most incredible moments of Jesus' ministry. He goes up on this mountain, and what happens, we refer to it as the transfiguration. Jesus uh, begins to glow, right? Like he begins to look like this angelic being. He usually looked like a normal human being, but in this moment, he begins to look different. And, and Moses and Elijah appear, and he begins to talk with them, okay? So this is not a normal experience. And the disciples realize that they're witnessing something incredible. Incredible. So it's kind of, it's like a, an ultimate like mountaintop experience. It's almost a little bit of a parallel back to the Old Testament when Moses went up on the mountain, remember? And he went up there, he was leading uh, the Israelites, he had led them out of Egypt. He goes on the mountain and God gives him the Ten Commandments and the law. He's up there with God for quite a while and, and it's this amazing experience. So then Moses begins to head down the mountain, and you remember the story. When he, gets, when he starts to get down the mountain, he sees a mess. The people, in this short time Moses has been gone, the people have given up on their God. They have began to worship a false god, a golden calf, you know? And so Moses goes from, from the top of the mountain, being in the presence of God, being physically given the law, to all of a sudden seeing the people worship an idol. I mean, you want to talk about kind of like crashing down off of that spiritual high, right? That'll do it right there. And sometimes when we have mountaintop experiences, we come down and we find some golden calf moments. We get back to regular life. Things aren't as good as they were when we were on the mountain, right? We, we've all been through this, I'm guessing, uh, where you have this incredible moment with God, or maybe you go to a camp or a time away or something like that, and it's amazing, and then you come back, and life is messy. It's painful. There's problems. We still experience all of these kinds of things. And Jesus himself experienced this. In fact, uh, Raphael did a picture of this or painting of this transfiguration, and you've got here Jesus up here in all of his glory, and Moses and Elijah, but then down here, it's a little hard to see, but you have this boy who is oppressed by this demon, and that's what Jesus finds when he comes down from the mountain. So he goes from the presence of God uh, down to, the, to back to regular earth where evil exists. Listen to this story. We're going to read it from Mark chapter 9. It's in three of the Gospels, but we'll read it from Mark this morning. It says, When they, that's Jesus, James, Peter, James, and John, returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some of the teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe. They ran to greet him. What's all this arguing about? Jesus asked. So Jesus goes from, from this great moment up here on the mountain, and he comes back down, and he sees the disciples, and they're in some theological debate with the religious leaders. 
Great. I leave you guys for what? Not all that long, and you're already causing trouble. What's all the fighting about? What's going on here, Jesus asked. So Jesus goes from his mountaintop experience and comes kind of crashing back to reality here. Verse 17, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out this evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Okay, so this man brings his son who's been been, uh, oppressed by this evil spirit. And the, the poor boy is suffering greatly. It's almost, it, it sounds almost like a version of epileptic seizures kind of thing. It's, that would probably be our closest comparison. And, and so he has these experiences. And so I brought him for here for healing. Your disciples, they tried to cast out this spirit, but they couldn't do it. And so that's probably what they got into this argument with the religious leaders over is why can't this happen? Why aren't they able to, to do this? And, and you know, this, this story is tough. It's tough to read because it, it's so sad to think of a child in this position. The original language suggests that he's not a toddler, but he's also not a teenager yet. This is a, an elementary school kind of age kid, right? And, and this poor boy in his body is, is experiencing this, this tension be, between good and, and evil in a very real way. That Satan is, is, is oppressing him. Satan is causing these awful things to happen to him. And, and so it's, it's a big problem. We, we would feel terrible if we were parents and one of our kids was going through this kind of thing. We would do anything we could to fix it. It would be a problem for us. But in these days, it was an even different kind of problem. Because while they loved their children and cared about their children and all that kind of stuff... There was another aspect to children that is a little different than it is for us, and that is the financial aspect. You see, in in our world today, if you talk about having kids, right, what's that phrase? It says, if you wait to to have kids so you can afford them, you'll never have them, right? Because they're expensive, they cost a lot. I mean, in our family, we, we have three of them, right? And I remember last spring, my wife was in school, and one day I was leaving early for work, and, and one of our kids said, Dad, why do you have to go into work so much? And I said, it's kind of probably in a kind of a thin moment emotionally, I said, well, there's how many people in this household? Five. And how many of them earn a check? One. So what do you think is the best thing for me to do today are you going to go to work probably wasn't my nicest response ever but whatever we don't view our kids as financial uh, assets right they're financial liabilities but in those days most people lived on a farm uh, in Israel most were farmers of some type and so and so you needed help to do this because you didn't just run big equipment around, right? You, you had to have manual labor to do this. And so your kids were helping out with the tasks around the house or around the farm or the family business. Uh, so they began to be financial assets pretty early on. Furthermore, you didn't have pensions or IRAs or Social Security or whatever for retirement. Instead, you had kids. Specifically, you had sons. You love daughters, they're great, but the problem is the daughter's going to get married and is going to go live on that guy's property and not going to take care of you. So you needed sons. Because when your sons would get older, they would get married, they would move their wife onto your property, build onto your house, and work in your business. So this way, as you get older and you get to where you can do less and less, you've got your sons and their family around. Um, another gospel tells that this is this guy's only son, okay? So it's not just that he loves the kid, but, but a kid in this position isn't going to be able to take care of mom and dad in the long haul. So this was a very big problem. So this poor kid, his body is this battlefield between good and evil. Um, another gospel tells us that when he'd have these events, he would be rendered mute, like he couldn't say anything. So here this poor boy is, he's going through all of this, and he can't even cry out for help. How awful would it be to be in that parent's position? You can't hardly leave the kid alone because you don't know when he's gonna, when one of these is gonna happen. You can't send him out swimming with his friends because he could drown. He can't be in a position where he could be harmed if, if one of these things happen. How many nights had they spent just sleeping at the foot of his bed? 
How many times have they cried out to God and said, God, why? Why our kid? Why can't he be like all the other kids? Why does he have to be oppressed in this way? Why? So they bring him to Jesus. They bring him to Jesus. The disciples try to cast out the demon, and they fail. Jesus says in, in verse 19, he responds, and he says, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, don't miss this. Jesus is annoyed, okay? He's seriously annoyed. I mean, we think of Jesus, right, as always just kind of like smiling, soft voice, happy, angels playing in the background, right? No, Jesus is annoyed here. He's irritated. He says basically to his disciples, how much longer do I have to be on this earth for? How much longer do I have to hang out with you guys for? I mean, how long must I put up with you is his exact words. Bring him over here. Bring the boy to me. So Jesus is annoyed with him. It's not really a great day to be a disciple, don't you think? I mean, they tried to cast out the demon. They failed. And then what does Jesus do? He kind of calls them out in front of all this big crowd, right? Like, seriously, guys, how much more do I have to put up with you, right? Like, Jesus, couldn't we talk about this later? And the crowd's looking at us weird. Isn't this awkward, you know? But, but this is where they're at. So, so Jesus kind of calls them out. He, and why is he annoyed? Well, he's annoyed because they've tried to do this on their own power. They're demonstrating that they think that they got this, that they can do this. They're, they're not leaning into the power of Jesus. I mean, here, they are his own disciples. If anybody should be bringing this boy to Jesus, it should be his disciples. And yet, in this situation, they're trying to do this on their own strength and their own power. You can almost hear them, right? Like, come on, Jesus, we've been around you for a while. We've watched enough of this. We've, we've been to, like, demon casting out school here, right? I mean, sure, some of us got C's, but C's get degrees, right? I mean, come on, why can't, let us try, right? Why are you getting so mad at us just because this didn't work out? Jesus is, is frustrated with them. These disciples literally did life with Jesus, and yet they fail to bring this kid to Jesus for healing. Jesus gets annoyed. How many times, look at your own life, how many times would you say that Jesus might feel this way with you? How many times do you or I encounter a problem and we make prayer our last resort? Like the, I'll do everything else, try to fix it all on my own, do all this stuff, and if it's really failing and not happening, maybe I'll say a quick prayer as I'm driving. How many times do we do that? How many times do we make prayer our kind of last resort or back up to all this other stuff? And, and don't hear me wrong. It's not that we shouldn't take action. Clearly, we need to. But prayer should not be the last resort. Prayer should not be the thing we turn to when all else fails and there seems to be no other option. No, prayer should be, I mean, it's God we're talking to here, right? The creator of the universe, the all-powerful one. Why on earth would we make him our last resort? So, so Jesus, he wants us to bring our needs to him. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. It, um, it tells us so many times throughout scripture uh, to pray for those who are sick, to, to bring them before the throne of grace uh, in that way. So verse 20, so they brought the boy to Jesus. When the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, like a toddler. The spirit often throws him into the fire or water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Now think about that. This boy, he's probably somewhat disfigured from some of the injuries that he's had through this. He's certainly suffered an awful lot. This, this spirit is trying to kill him, it says. And, and how many times has this guy prayed? How many times has this guy hoped? How many things, crazy things has he tried to fix this? And so he comes to Jesus with kind of a, it's almost laughable version of faith when you re read it, right? Have mercy on us and help us if you can. That seems like a weird thing to say to the guy who like walks on water and feeds the 5,000 and all this stuff. He's God, right? I mean, 
it would be like, let's say that you came uh, to the church early this week, you're bring, dropping off your Revive Ohio dessert, and you come and you, you're going to walk out the doors, and you hear a basketball bouncing, and you hear, and you think, well, that's strange. What's who's playing basketball? So you walk in the door, and you find in this room, in here, all by himself, is LeBron James. He just dropped by for the day. He's getting a little extra practice in our our room. Why? I don't know. I wrote the story. I can make it however I want, right? So LeBron is in here. He's practicing. And you are so excited to meet him, so you go up to him, and you get an autograph, right? You talk to him a little bit, and before you go, you say, you know what, Could it would be awesome just to get to see you dunk a basketball right here, just, just you and me watching, right? Like, could, could you dunk a basketball just for me if you can? Would you say it that way? I wouldn't say it that way. It's LeBron James. What do you mean, if you can? Of course he can. That's easy for him. He's fully capable of this kind of thing, right? So, Jesus, have mercy on us and help us if you can. Jesus, again, kind of fires back a snappy response. Verse 23, what do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. Wow. What do you mean, if I can? But you'd think the default. you think he would have said, what do you mean, if I can? I'm God. I can do whatever, right? But no, he doesn't go that way. Instead, he says, anything is possible if a person believes. Now, don't misunderstand. This can be kind of a tough phrase. He didn't say, anything will happen that you believe in, okay? He didn't, doesn't guarantee that if you believe something's possible, that it absolutely will happen. If that were the case, you would be God, not God, and, and you're not. Sorry, I'm not either. So it doesn't say that anything you believe in will happen, but it says that anything is possible if a person believes. God can do anything. So we ought to pray as if God can do anything. Even though we don't always get what we want, we still must believe that God can do anything because he is fully capable. Verse 24, I think this is one of the best prayers in the whole Bible. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Have you prayed that one before? I've prayed it, I don't even know how many times. You need to memorize this prayer. Lord, I believe, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. Because that's often how it goes. We believe in God. We know that God is all-powerful, but there's also a component of us, there's, there's a component of us that, that has some doubts, that doesn't fully believe. So I believe, but yet I have some seeds of unbelief. God, would you help me with this? Yesterday we had a prayer seminar in here, uh, Tyler referenced, and, and Luther, who was leading that, he made a great comment. He said, faith is not the absence of doubt, okay? Faith does not mean that there is no doubt present whatsoever. Faithful people have doubts. It's okay. We said faith is acting in spite of those doubts. Faith is being willing to pray to God even when you have doubts. Lord, I believe, but would you help my unbelief? Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Let that be our prayer. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. It's really straightforward. Jesus, by his own authority, commands this spirit to leave. Verse 26, then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. Now, don't miss this. The initial response here is, Jesus has commanded this spirit to get out of him, and now it's killed him. Thanks a lot, Jesus. We bring him here to you, and he's dead. He was better off before meeting you, it seems. Sometimes we have these, these moments in life where things appear to be dead. Many of us in various ways have been left for dead by others. Maybe you've been in a situation, some of you have been in health situations that truly seemed hopeless. And, 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 it, and it seemed that there was nothing else other than physical death. And yet you're alive 
today. Others, maybe it's your marriage. Uh, everybody around you said it's hopeless. There's just no hope for you guys. It's not, not going to get any better. Or your finances or an addiction or your relationship with the kids or whatever it may be, we've been left for dead. But hear what Jesus does. Verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Okay? So everybody else thinks the child is dead. Jesus reaches down, takes him by the hand, and helps him to stand up. Have you ever been down on the ground and somebody's helped you stand up? Yeah, you've experienced this before. When that happens, you need the help of the person to help you get up, right? This kid had just been through this violent physical experience. He needs Jesus' help to get him up. But you know what else he has to do? He's got to stand himself up. Have you ever tried to lift up a kid who wouldn't let you lift him up? You know, they play like the, you know, I'm dead game in the store or something like that, right? Yeah, we've been there. It's really tough. Even a little 30-pound kid is real heavy when they're not trying to help you up, right? It's just this kind of dead weight, we say, right? It involves action. If somebody's helping you up, you got to stand up as well. You've got, to, you've got to bend your joints. You've got to activate those muscles. You've got, to, you've got to stand up as well. So the boy doesn't stand up on his own power. He needs Jesus' power. But by the same token, he, he, by the same token, he also must act. And it's a perfect, perfect example of faith. Your notes tell you that faith is an internal conviction that shows itself through external action. Faith is an internal conviction that shows itself through external action. In other words, faith without works is dead. That's James' version of that statement. Faith without works is dead. If I have faith that God can do anything, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And then when Jesus reaches out to me, I respond by standing up. I respond by taking action. Others have left your marriage for dead. Don't you believe it? Don't believe it. Jesus is reaching out. He can heal, but you're going to have to do something too, okay? You can't just keep doing the same stupid stuff you've been doing and expect change. You may have to go to a counselor. You may have to humble yourself and apologize. You may need to read some books. You may, I don't know what, but, but don't believe that it's dead, but also don't believe that it's going to change if you don't do something. You got to bring yourself to Jesus and say, Lord, we need your healing. We need your touch. We need your wholeness. We need you to help change us. And when Jesus reaches out, you respond by standing back up. Maybe you've been left for dead financially. Things aren't good. You've been through bankruptcy. You've built lost jobs, whatever. Well, well you, you give that to Jesus. Lord, would you heal our finances? Would you help us? And, and then when Jesus reaches out, you're going to take some steps. You're going to sign up for Financial Peace University. You're going to live on a budget. You're going to cut some of those expenses that got you into this place. You might drive an older car. You might live in a smaller house. But you're going to respond by standing up as Jesus pulls you up. There's countless examples of this in our lives, friends. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. And then when Jesus reaches out to us, we stand up. We stand up. Verse 28. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. Don't miss this. You can't do Jesus' work without Jesus' power. It's just not going to happen. Disciples couldn't cast him out on his own. We need to bring our friends to God. We need to bring ourselves to God because you can't do Jesus' work apart from without Jesus' power. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So that leaves you with a choice. You've got a choice in your life between faith or failure. Either you're going to put your life into the hands of Jesus Christ. You're going to put yourself in God's hands, your creator, uh, or you're, you're going to live a life of, of failure, trying to do Jesus' work on your own strength. And friends, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is the one who has the power to heal. You've got friends in your life. You've got perhaps your children, perhaps your coworkers, perhaps um, other people that you know who need a healing touch from Jesus. Won't you bring them to him? Now, this story... It, it ends nicely, right? The, the, the demon is cast out, the boy is healed, and life goes on very well. 
We've experienced that at times. Do you know, do you, do you believe that God can heal? Do you? I do. I do. In fact, I want to show you, uh, I want to show you a video of uh, Gary. You know Gary sings on our praise team sometimes. He keeps our building looking good. Gary was at a conference with uh, Sarah, our nursery coordinator, was there as well, some folks from our church uh, called Voice of the Apostles. And Gary experienced something pretty powerful there. Check this out. Holy Spirit on young people. This is Gary Anderson. Yes, sir. Tell us your testimony in two minutes or less. All right, here we go. Wait a minute. Just, yeah. just, okay, two minutes. Here we go, here we go. Um, I was in the United States Army and I uh, did a night. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, um, I used to jump out of planes. Don't ask me why I'm scared. I'm afraid of heights. Well, I did, a, I did a night jump in a Bragg and I broke my back and was laid up for a long time. When I got better, my back continued to go down. So I had a total of 15 surgeries on my spine and I'm full of screws. I could barely move around and I got two bulging now as we speak in my neck and I got a scar across the front where they went in there and, and, and did their work. I want to tell you, I came up here last night just to goof around. I didn't come expecting anything. <laughs> Well, they did a healing ceremony. They started praying. I don't know who touched me, but it felt like everybody in here had the hand on some part of my body. And the way it worked out is the pain that I've been in for over 18 years stopped. For the first time, for the very first time in 18 years, for the first time in my life, I laid down last night and I slept something I've never been able to do. I slept. I'm telling you now, it, I feel so good. I'm 52. I feel so good. I feel like I'm 17 again. I can't stop moving. I'm driving my friends crazy because I just want to run around. Look here. Thank you. Give Jesus a shout because it's because of him. Hallelujah. Because of him. This is Amen. happening now. Amen. So that happens at this incredible conference and very powerful stuff. Jesus heals there. He heals in other ways, too. He heals here. In fact, yesterday, so we had right in this room, we had this uh, the, the, uh, prayer workshop we told you about earlier. And uh, Luther was leading it. At the end, we took some time and we prayed for folks, uh, prayed specifically for healing. We had a, a lady who had walked in here, an elderly lady who came in here with a walker. She didn't, hadn't had to use a walker throughout most of her life, but had some problems with her back recently. She couldn't walk without that thing. And, and I'm not kidding you. We sat right back there. We had a table there. We sat there. We, we prayed over her and we get done praying and she gets up and she walks across the room without this walker, like right here right and some of us were a little worried right because she's older right we're thinking what if she's wrong right you know what if she thinks she's healed and yeah, not so much right falls backwards lawsuits all these things right so we're kind of like walking behind her right and she's like I don't need help you know and she's walking you know just God healed her right here another person came in with a, a ringing in her ears right pray for that and, and this is gone and and God heals he does this is the same Jesus who did this stuff, right? It's not a different version of Jesus today. We just don't see him in the same physical way. So we believe that God heals. We bring our friends to God because we know that he heals. Yes, sometimes we may pray and we may not get everything we want in this moment. It's a reminder to us. It's a reminder to us that God also heals throughout all of eternity. Uh, we'll wrap up with this. Revelation uh, chapter 21. Uh, we'll begin, let's uh, uh, so we begin verse 1 here. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. Then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a shout from the throne saying, Look, God's, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Would you read with me verse 4? Let's read it aloud. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. Verse 5. Then the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Do you believe that? Friends, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. 
God is, God created, and God is about this process of recreation, and someday he wipes away all the tears, he wipes away all the pain, there's no more sadness, no more sickness, all of this. In the meantime, we bring him to Jesus, we bring him to Jesus, because he is the one who heals. God, thank you for your healing power in our lives. Lord, we praise you because you do heal. Whether it's physically, whether it's spiritually, whether it is emotionally, God, you bring healing in so many different ways, and we give you praise. Lord, we believe. Would you help our unbelief? God, I pray that you would help us just to encounter the power of, of your healing touch in our lives. God, I pray for those today who need to experience that power. God, may they receive from you this very day. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.